Hey everybody, Seth V here for the Knife Center. Today, we're talking about knife locks. We see a lot of conversations happening online in the comments and elsewhere about which knife lock is best, which knife lock is strongest, which is easiest to use, and while we may not be able to definitively answer those questions today, I pulled just about every knife lock we have on our shelves so we can look at them and compare them. So let's jump into it. First up, this is the Oppenel number 10. These are $20 with almost four inches of blade. And this is standing in for our friction folder. Uh, the very first folding knives were much like this. No real lock to speak of, even though the Oppenel does have this rotating ring, which we'll get to. You simply push the blade closed and pull it open. And there's really nothing stopping you from doing that other than the friction in the pivot. Now, what makes Oppenel's special is this rotating ring. And this is a uh, rudimentary locking mechanism. I, I say rudimentary because there's no spring-loaded um, automatic engagement or anything like that. You have to do it yourself. But by rotating this ring, you put a block in the path of the knife closing. So now, it's essentially locked in place. Open it up to close, and there we go. So the big drawback to something like this is that it doesn't engage automatically. You have to do it yourself, and depending how tight you twist that lock, it's gonna change the strength of your lockup. Not ideal for when you're on the go, when you don't wanna to have to think about your lock. So despite the drawbacks of a friction folder, they're still very popular today, uh, simply because of their simplicity. These are super affordable, Dead simple, very few parts. Uh, they work, they work great, but there are certainly other options now. So before we get to the rest of the knives, let's talk about a slip joint. A slip joint is not a locking knife, but because the back spring provides a fair amount of tension, it does kind of automatically open and close, meaning that it snaps into place and there's a good amount of resistance that will even push it back if you happen to put a little force. That right there is a half stop. Another safety feature that catches the blade before it goes all the way closed. And there we go. Also stays closed on its own because of that back spring tension. And from here forward, every single one of these locks is gonna operate off of spring tension. This little bogus slip joint comes in at $104.96 on the site right now. Beautiful little slip joint, made in Germany, but not a locking knife, so let's move on. The next lock I wanted to talk about is the back lock. Dependable, I couldn't not bring out a buck 110 here. This really defined the category for over half a century now. This is the back lock knife when we think of back lock knives. USA made this special edition one comes in at $199 uh, with marble carbon fiber scales, S45 VN steel, a pocket clip, but let's talk about the lock. So kind of like a slip joint, a back lock does have a sprung uh, back spring here, but it's independently movable and you can, un you can disengage it by pressing on the back here and pushing the blade closed with the other hand. Like a slip joint, it has a good self-close, which means that the knife springs back into the handle should you pull it out just not quite far enough. Back locks are great. Despite the age, they have a lot of advantages. First of all, they're very strong because there's actually a fair bit of contact here between the blade and the back spring. Um, it's almost like a little deadbolt in the way that it snaps into place in a little notch in the tang and it really holds the knife closed with, with great strength. For years, these have been among the strongest locks, and while more modern locks may have eclipsed them now, uh, still can't go wrong with a back lock. Dependable, strong. The one disadvantage of this back lock as it's implemented here on the buck is that it's a little hard to close one-handed because of how far away this disengagement point is from where you're normally holding the knife. You kind of have to reposition it and use both hands to close it. Uh, again, it feels a little old-fashioned at this point. That's where this comes in. This is also a back lock, 
but if you'll notice, the disengagement point has moved from the back kind of to the middle of the handle. We call this a mid-back lock. Uh, this was made famous by Almar. This really, just a simple change of where you're disengaging that lock makes these a lot more usable in my opinion, uh, especially because you can very easily with one hand disengage that lock. And if the knife is designed well, as it is on this Gerber Gator, which comes in at $50.95 on the website right now, you can actually close it one-handed by catching the unsharpened part of the blade with your finger and then closing the rest of the way. Once you get the hang of it, it's pretty easy, but it's not exactly fidget friendly, which is where liner locks come in. Michael Walker is credited with inventing the liner lock, but he didn't quite invent the liner lock. And, and let me explain. So before Michael Walker came along, liner locks did exist, but they looked more like this. This is a case rust lock, which comes in at $79.99 on the website right now. And it does have a liner lock. However, it does not have Michael Walker's key innovation, which was the detent ball. And because of that, this liner lock does nothing to hold this blade closed. Uh, instead, there's a back spring here, just like that slip joint. There's a back spring that provides the tension to pull the knife closed. The liner just acts as a sort of secondary lock that holds, that locks the knife in place when it's open. So in order to disengage it, you have to push that liner lock to the side and then overcome the back spring tension to get that knife closed. Works okay, but because there's nothing protecting the liner from the blade, it's not very smooth in operation. You kind of feel the friction of that whole face of the liner rubbing on the blade. So what Michael Walker did is he put a little detent ball inside the liner, which allowed it both to move more smoothly over the face of the blade, and this is the key thing, holds it closed at a single point. So that detent ball falls into a little round hole drilled into the blade. Rather than a uh, spring pushing against the back of the blade, like on a back lock, a detent ball holds the big blade closed in exactly one position. So once you get the blade open, there's nothing pushing it back closed again. But because it's so tightly held right here, what you can do, manually flip it open. So you push against that detent ball and it overcomes it all at once and the blade snaps open. It seems so simple and obvious now. We use it, almost every brand has a liner lock that they make. But man, that little detent ball is what is behind flippers and thumb studs and all the snappy fun action that we uh, like to fidget with these days. It's all thanks to Michael Walker's key detent innovation. This knife, before we move on, is the Ferrum Forge Stinger. Comes in at $90 right now. Super great action on this, really showing off that detent. You can flick it open. Anyway, let's move on. Frame locks. A frame lock is just a liner lock on steroids, maybe. It's thicker. You can see it from the outside because it's not a liner hidden by a scale. It's part of the frame. It works identically though. It's still just a sprung liner that kind of kicks in to hold the blade in place when it opens. The blade stops against a stop pin back here. And like that liner lock, fantastic snappy action. The detent holds it closed very tightly and then boom, it flips open. So this frame lock here is the ZT0452CF designed by Dmitry Sinkovich. ZT does a fantastic job. They're well known for their frame locks and their flipping action. Super snappy, super fast. Uh, now, some people will tell you that a, that a frame lock is stronger. And while that might be true some of the time, it's not necessarily true. It really depends on, you know, the particular knife and its lock face geometry and, you know, spring tension and all those little things that can help make a knife more stable and secure. At best, it's gonna be a marginal improvement over a liner lock. They are generally not as strong as a back lock, but you can't do that with a back lock. So before we get into the proprietary stuff, we have one more lock that pretty much any company can use, and that is the button lock. 
So button locks have been around a good long time, but they seem to be kind of having a moment right now. This is the CRKT Brian Tai Fighter, $49.95 on the website. And what you get with a button lock, aside from a dead simple interface, I mean, it doesn't get any easier than push the button to unlock. Incredible fluid motion. When done well, like on this Brian Tai Fighter, button locks have phenomenal action. So fun, so satisfying, almost silky smooth. The way they lock up though, is, uh, is pretty similar to some of these other locks. So we have a stop pin that catches the blade in the open position. And uh, the button is sort of just a plunger that wedges itself between the stop pin and the tang to hold the knife open. Next up is the crossbar lock. Now this one, I, I had to show an access lock because the Benchmade access lock was the one that started it all. Invented by Bill McHenry and Jason Williams, the access lock is, is something different for sure. So Benchmade makes a lot of access knives. This one though is the 945 Mini Osborne coming in at 174.25 on the website. The access lock is no longer under patent by Benchmade, but Benchmade is definitely the company that did it first made it famous, and uh, made it kind of essential. I, I really think an access lock is one of those locks every knife guy should try. It's really fun, really fluid, and a number of key advantages. Um, number one, it's ambidextrous. You can actuate this access bar on the right or the left hand side exactly the same. It doesn't require you to move your hands or put them in the path of the blade as you're closing the knife, like you do for a liner lock or a frame lock. You can simply pull it back, flip the knife closed. So the way this works, similar to the other ones you've seen, we've got a stop pin here and this bar that runs all the way through the liners on either side and out to the scales, sort of wedges itself in the tang there. The access lock is also very strong because we get a round bar that's holding the blade open essentially. So in order for this blade to close, the access lock needs to be pulled back or an entire liner round bar interface has to crumple, which is, takes a lot of force to happen. Ever since the Benchmade access lock patent expired, other brands have been doing their spin on this type of lock. And we've come to call this type of lock a crossbar lock to give it a generic non-branded name. So, when SOG does it, they call it the XR lock, but they're all kind of functioning the same. They're all crossbar locks, and it all started with the Benchmade Axis lock. So next up is a proprietary lock from Spyderco that looks a lot like an Axis lock, but is not. This is the ball bearing lock on a Manix 2 XL, coming in at 185.50 on the website right now. So it looks a lot like an Axis lock. We got a sliding kind of bar what looks like a bar here, but actually what this, what's visible is a plastic cage, which sort of cradles a steel ball bearing that's pushed by a coil spring in this little piece right here. So the coil spring is pushing tension that way, pushing the ball forward so that when you open the knife, it snaps into place. And because it functions so similar to the axis lock, a lot of the advantages are the same. It's ambidextrous, you get to keep your hands out of the path of the blade. It's pretty snappy, very fluid motion. Like that axis lock, it's also very strong. In order for this lock to fail, that ball bearing needs to crumple or the lock interface needs to slip. And with spring tension, that's just not super likely to happen. So with a lot of these modern locks, what's gonna fail first is actually gonna be the blade. Usually they're kind of over specced for this and uh, I'm not saying it can't happen. A locks certainly can and do fail, but uh, you get so much safety and security with a modern lock like this. Um, I don't find myself ever really worried about it. Next up, another one from Spyderco. This is their famous compression lock. Here on the Capara, this knife uh, comes in at $203 right now. And showing off that compression lock. 
So I've heard the compression lock described as a reverse liner lock before, and that's kind of descriptive of how you use it, but it's not, it doesn't quite capture how it actually works. So it is indeed part of the liner here, just like a liner lock, and you'll probably notice it's on the spine side of the knife rather than on the uh, inside of the knife, like a liner lock. So I can see why people call it a reverse liner lock, but a liner lock kind of just works like a kickstand. It, it just sort of props the blade open. A compression lock, however, works more similar to an axis lock or this ball bearing lock or even this button lock where there's actually physically a piece of the liner wedged in between the tang of the blade and the stop pin. Unlike a liner lock, you get a ton of strength from this. That piece is really stuck in there. That piece of the liner is, is, is truly wedged in there. It's in compression. So as forces are put on this blade, that liner is not being uh, pushed back like it would be on a liner lock. It's being squeezed. So steel in compression is much stronger, which is what allows this compression lock to be rated uh, for much higher strength. Like a liner lock, it has a ball detent. So you get that super snappy opening that you get with a, with a liner lock or a frame lock. I think that's part of the popularity of the compression lock. It's snappy like a liner lock, but you can operate it without ever putting your hands in the path of the blade. So you can just fluidly operate it open and closed. You can even, if you want, kind of pull the, pull, pull the liner to the side and fling it out. Super fun to fidget with and definitely a staple of Spyderco's lineup. Okay, let's move on to some weirder ones. These locks, these next two locks are locks that are actually only seen on these models on the table right now. And the first one is from Steel Will. This is their Ant Lock and this is the Tasso, which comes in at $159.99. This is an interesting one. Uh, it Again, it kind of looks from the outside a lot like an axis lock. Oh, there seems to be a little bar that you pull on and Indeed, it feels a lot like an axis lock, but if you'll notice, the direction of travel of the ant lock is not back and forth like it is on the axis lock, it's up and down. And what you're doing here, it's difficult to see from the outside, but what's happening here is you're rotating a almost like a, a minuscule back lock in there that's snapping into the tang of the blade. And by pushing this up, you're rotating it around the stop pin and disengaging that lock interface. So when it's open, it's locked into place against the tang of the blade. You push it up and it disengages that and the blade comes closed. So because this is the only model with the ant lock, uh, I can't confidently say exactly how strong it is compared to other locks, but I will say it's a whole lot of fun to use and uh, demonstrates one of the key advantages of a lot of the rest of these uh, modern lock designs on the table, which is that they don't require liners or big back springs in the backspacer. The whole lock mechanism is sort of located right around the pivot here. And so everything else on this knife is just nice, lightweight G10. There's no full liners. The backspacer is fully G10. The handles are sculpted G10. It allows you to make a knife. It has a nice, strong, modern lock, but it's lightweight. It's well balanced. It is not overburdened with springs and metal in the handle. Hopefully we'll see more ant locks from Steel Will in the future. All right, let's move on to another weird one from Spyderco. This is the stop lock. This, is, this knife is called the Parata. It comes in at $196. And this lock is quite similar to the ant lock but you know, different in the details, different in the details. It is a patented mechanism, so it, according to the government, it's meaningfully different. So by pushing up on this little arm here, you are rotating the locking faces that uh, hold the blade in place, You're rotating them out of the way so that the blade can swing close. And like the ant lock, this knife really shows off how little metal you actually need for this type of lock to safely hold the blade. You take a look at this handle, it's just, it's just two slabs of G10 the whole way through. 
no liners, nothing. It gives this knife, even though it has this massively wide curvy blade, it's got a real kind of featherweight feel because of how little they've had to put into the handle to make this lock work. And like an axis lock or a ball bearing lock, it's ambidextrous too. So righties and lefties get the exact same experience out of it. You can even flip it open and close with a little practice. So maybe we'll see more of this lock from Spyderco in the future, but who knows? Next up, we get to the Andrew Demko section of this video. Um, Andrew Demko designed three locks on the table here. He kind of looms large in the knife lock designing scene, if you want to call it that. Um, this first one here really uh, was an important innovation for cold steel in particular. This is the triad lock and you know, it functions much like an old school backlock. And it's a very, it's just a simple addition that he made to this old school backlock design to get us to this triad lock. It is right here, the stop pin. So one of the drawbacks of a backlock, I didn't get into, I'm saving it for this section, is that both the blade and the piece that's holding the blade in place are movable. So the blade pivots around a pin and the lock bar pivots around a pin. And what that means is that unless your tolerances are really dialed in and your lock geometry is just perfect, you're gonna have some wiggle. You're gonna have some wobble. It's, it's just how it is. Um, making a back lock without any flex in the mechanism is, is hard to do. Companies do it all the time, but it's difficult. The triad lock kind of solves that problem by putting a stop pin here, a fixed stop pin that does not move between the blade and the back spring. You eliminate all that blade play and make the lock a lot stronger besides. And Cold Steel have taken the triad lock to its limit. This is the Raja 2 six inch blade, $104.95. <laughs> this knife could not be this size really without the triad lock. Um, the security and strength you get from this lock uh, gives you the confidence to use a massive folding knife like this hard. I did own one of these and I've, I've chopped with it. I even batoned with it. And the lock, the triad lock, just kind of shrugged off the abuse. Uh, one of the things that it's particularly good at, uh, aside from just the raw strength in here, is its ability to lock up securely over time. There's a lot of uh, kind of extra space built into this lock bar so that even if the lock face of the blade gets a little deformed from some, uh, uh, from some abuse, it can still kind of reset itself into the lock face. So these the triad lock just lasts and lasts and lasts and it's very familiar, uh, but this simple innovation kind of, kind of changed the game for them. Next up from Demco and Cold Steel, we have the AD15. This knife comes in at $172.95 and it features Demco's Scorpion Lock. You can see it right here on the handle. It is this kind of integrated bar that lifts up a pin from the blade to allow the knife to close. Kind of like the Triad Lock, it's a bit of a twist on a back lock mechanism. It's just instead of a square shaped back spring sitting into a notch. It's this little round pin here that's embedded in this lock bar. And the spring tension comes from a hidden spring in this backspacer portion right here. Again, it's ambidextrous. The way that you operate it takes some getting used to because you have to kind of pinch and lift up this bar, but it's easy enough to do. I, I would almost describe this as like the frame lock of back locks because they've taken an element of the back lock that was hidden and made it integral to the handle. Arguably, you could even say this has some extra security because kind of like a frame lock, if you're gripping the knife hard, you're putting extra force into that locking mechanism and wedging it even tighter closed. So far, the AD15 is the only knife with a scorpion lock, but maybe we'll see more. Time will tell. Next up is the newest from Demco, and this is actually not a cold steel. This is the AD 20.5. They come in at 
when they're in stock. Unfortunately, they're not at this moment. I pulled this one uh, from one of the employees here just to show it off on camera. This is Demco's latest lock. This is the shark lock. And you can see the little shark fin right there sticking out of the back. Pull it up and back and the knife swings close. Lots of people are really excited about this lock because it does so much of what Demco does well, even better. It's strong. We've got the same kind of stop pin and lock bar thing going on that we get on a triad lock where we're really wedging everything together against a fixed stop pin. But you also have the ease of operation of something kind of like an axis lock where you, you know, you don't need to put your hands in the path of the blade. You can hold the knife quite naturally, pull it back, simply let the blade close. Really satisfying action, strong, totally ambidextrous. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot more knives from Demco with the Shark Lock. Definitely has a hit with this. Again, it's that killer combination of strength, ease of use, and fidgetability, let's be real. I think you hand this to a knife guy, have him play with it for a while, they won't wanna put it down. So next up, another fun, strong lock, also new to the market, CRKT Deadbolt. This lock mechanism was designed by Flavio Icoma, and it has a lot of the key advantages of many of these modern locks. Another advantage of this is you can actually set the detent to your own taste. So a lot of these locks, the locking mechanism and the detent mechanism, that is the thing that holds the blade closed, are the same thing. With the deadbolt, they're actually different. So the locking mechanism is here just around the pivot and the detent is adjusted with this little set screw right here. You can make it stronger or weaker to your taste and it allows you to really tune flipping action or the deployment exactly how you like it. So the deadbolt works. You can kind of see on the other side, we've got this bar here. There are two, well, call them bolts that when the knife opens, the two bolts sink into the tang of the blade and set it in place against uh, the stop pin, which in this case are the thumb studs pushing against the uh, frame. A lot of the same advantages with this deadbolt that you get with a lot of these other modern locks. You don't have to put your hands in the path of the blade as you close it. And even though it's not ambidextrous, it's not lefty unfriendly. It's just, well, lefties are already used to living in a right-handed world. A little awkward, but I could do it, so. I figure lefties who've had lots of practice will have no problem. The deadbolt is a super strong, super fun lock. Definitely glad to see it on more CRKT models, um, and I'm sure we'll see more from them too. Next up, we got one kind of from the archives. This is the Kershaw Speed Bump, uh, on sale, as a matter of fact, at the moment for $32.95. Uh, now this locking mechanism is easy to see exactly how it works because it is completely visible. Um, rather than being kind of hidden in the handle somewhere, this lock is just embedded within the blade. Kershaw calls this the stud lock, and I believe it was invented by Ken Onion. You can see the little coil spring here in the blade and the little ledge that these stop pins snap into. So in order to disengage the lock, you just push it forward and the blade comes closed. This is a speed safe knife, so you're gonna have to overcome that spring tension when you close it, but it's really fun to be able to see the whole locking mechanism in action here. I think Kershaw used to make more knives with this lock, but this is the last one still in production. It's on sale now. I don't know how long that these will be around, but if you like interesting locking mechanisms, uh, definitely check this one out. It's a lot of fun. And uh, this design is pretty cool too. Very old school can onion, nice and curvy, sweet. Well, and last but not least, we've come full circle to I don't know what to call this. A friction folder, a funny folder. I'll just show you how it works. You can maybe come up for a name with, for it yourself. This is a little small custom folder from Fred Perrin. And it opens like so. So 
I, I don't really know how to describe this. I mean, it's not a lock like anything else here on the table, but man, when this is open, that blade is fixed in place. It's completely surrounded on either side by folded metal handles. Uh, there's no way to disengage this without opening up the whole thing again. Pretty fun, nice little package. Certainly doesn't look like a knife in your pocket. There you go, it is. This is called the Lipitri by Fred Perrin. A custom made and believe it or not, only $32.95. Pretty great price, but that lock might take some getting used to. So I tried to pull just about every locking mechanism you're likely to encounter off to show to you guys today. Uh, but there are new locks happening all the time. Uh, and there's no better illustration of that <laughs> than to show you an old new lock that has been lost to the sands of time. I pulled this from Jason, our buyer's office. He's got a lot of old kind of curios in there. And this old thing is a, a demonstrator of the Neely lock. Um, probably something you've never heard of. It was not something I was familiar with before I found this. Uh, it is patented. This design is the Timber Light. In order to actuate the lock, you actually have to push this blade forward in order for it to be able to rotate closed. So it's easy to operate, to open with one hand. Um, yeah, you could close it with one too, but super simple. In fact, I don't know if I've seen a more simple lock than this. Is There's not even any like lock bar to speak of. It's just a tang with a unique shape that kind of springs back into place. Pretty cool. I don't know if these ever made to market. Um, let me know down in the comments if you've seen one of these in real life. If you've used one, I'd love to know how it held up, uh, if you like it. And uh, I'd like to know what locks I missed here. Um, I tried to pull everything I could, but I know for a fact there's stuff I didn't get to. Um, so if I missed your favorite, Drop it down in the comments. Uh, let's hear about it. So that just about wraps it up for this lock type overview video. Um, I hope this was interesting. If you want to get your hands on any of these knives and any more besides, check out the links in the description. Head over to knifecenter.com and be sure to sign up for our knife rewards program while you're there so you can get some free money to spend on your next knife. With that, I'm Seth V for the Knife Center. I'll see you next time.